<laughs> now go up. No, stop. Click. Click. Down. You get yes. it. Click. <laughs> Yes. Great. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Digital futures at its finest. So yeah. thank you, everyone, first of all, for inviting us to be a part of this session. It's really great to be here. My name's Hayley. I'm the Institute and Partnerships Manager for the Bristol Digital Futures Institute. Um, and just to give those of you who haven't come across us before a quick introduction. So we're a university research institute that was established in 2019. Um, in the university with a mission to really um, pioneer transformative approaches to digital innovation. Really? And what that Wait. means for us we is really developing. Um, can you hear me? Is it just us? Uh, I think it's just you. Yeah. I, can hear just I can hear her fine. <laughs> That's a new room. <laughs> just do a test again. Check that you can hear me okay. It worked before, so that's odd. Can you hear us now, Almar? I... It's got nothing to do with you, Haley. I don't okay. think. Uh, yeah. You can continue. You can continue. I'll just uh, play with my computer. So. Yeah. Let's okay. talk about that. No problem. Um, so yes, pioneering transformative approaches to digital innovation and specifically what that means to us, I guess, is understanding, developing a really in-depth understanding of socio-technical futures. So recognizing that the social and the technical are revolving in a, a sort of a, a, together and they're in a, inextricably linked. And given that that's how the world is developing, it makes sense then to drive the creation of digital technologies in a socio-technical way, doing socio-technical innovation specifically for more inclusive, prosperous and sustainable societies. So let's think about how we can much more proactively create these um, more positive futures by doing innovation differently. Um, we're delighted to be co-directed by Susan Halford and Dimitra um, Simunidu from across social sciences and engineering. So that demonstrates that real commitment to socio-technical um, working across the university's faculties. But of course, we're not just limited to engineering and social sciences. As a university research institute, we've got a remit to work across every faculty within the university. We're also really proud to have a really diverse set of partners from across industry, government, and civil society, and working together with all those different actors who bring very different sort of forms of knowledge and opinion um, to that innovation process is, is really critical actually to how we, how we work. And finally, we, were established in the same year that we were established as a university research institute, we were also very fortunate to receive 100 million pounds worth of co-investment, um, 29 million pounds from Research England to establish our um, core facilities um, and building. And that was matched by 71 million pounds worth of co-investment from that list of 27 partners. And what that allows is for us to, to have a home in the new Temple Quarter Enterprise Campus, which I'm gonna talk about um, in just a moment. Uh, so I think I can move along. Can I just check that you can see me moving now? Great, so I won't dwell on these. Um, I've kind of given you a bit of a, an overview, but BDFI has a series of founding principles um, that digital technologies are woven into the fabric of modern society that brings huge benefits, but it also brings challenges. And so, as I mentioned, in order to harness those opportunities and address the challenges, we really need to think about how we bring together different forms of knowledge and shape um, the futures together that might emerge as a result of these kind of innovation processes. Um, I won't dwell on that slide much longer because I think I'm a bit over time, but just to say, um, I mentioned that we've got this amazing network of research partners that were pulled together as part of this research um, uh, partnership investment fund from Research England, and here they all are. Um, they range from major telecoms, companies through to creative organizations, through to those in aerospace, to consultancies, to local communities in Bristol. And this is, I mean, obviously a, just an enormous asset um, for, um, for the university. And I guess as uh, my role um, as Institute and Partnership Manager, I'm sort of at the interface between the academic community in the university, but also these external partners and understanding their needs. And what I'd be really interested in learning more about is, you know, where there might be opportunities for you and your group to interact with 
um, these partners and develop collaborative new projects. To be clear, the £71 million worth of co-investment that has been committed by these organisations isn't money in the bank yet. We now have to kind of go and create those projects and, and realise the co-investment, whether that's in cash or in kind from all of these organisations. So what you can take from that is that there's a willing set of really excited partners who buy into the mission and vision. Um, and it would be great to talk about how we can um, make that work for you guys. Um, so this is often we often use this for external partners to say like what capability is is here within the university and i think this is always a really challenging slide right because there's so much capability and capacity across the university we think around 600 million pounds worth of work that's happening in the broad field of digital futures ranging from the future of the internet through to digital health through to digital media and creative um, and what's interesting is, is there's opportunities to bring those areas of expertise together from across very different parts of the university. And I've listed on the side here, I mean, these, you know, I guess you could sort of see these almost as areas of technology development, but there's um, data, AI, machine learning, sustainability, futures, behaviours, collaboration and co-production expertise, all of these sort of bullets are, are significant in their own right that tend to kind of cross cut um, the boxes um, that we've got on the left. Um, so as a, as a university research institute, we're really keen to try and bring those areas of expertise together and support new collaborative work at the interface of some of these perhaps more traditional disciplines. Um, so who is BDFI? We're, we're sort of building the infrastructure of the Institute, really. We're still quite new, you know, established in 2019, but um, things are moving quickly. Um, so we have a series of academics who are directly affiliated to the Institute, and we're super excited to have Sanya here today, who is one of those initial seven academics who will have a, a sort of a specific role with the Institute. We have seven right now across social sciences and engineering, but that's moving to 20 over the next, I think, year and a half. But that's not the entirety of kind of who, you know, of who BDFI is and, and can be. Um, what we're developing is also a, a, a kind of a pool of, of affiliate academics. So these are people who maybe their job isn't, doesn't explicitly, job description doesn't explicitly say BDFI within it, but they are interested academics working in the field of digital futures who feel they can get benefit from being part of the institute and we would love to work with them. Um, so a conversation to have with this group is how you might be able to make use of that um, affiliate membership if we want to call it that. So on to the facilities. Um, these are some whizzy pictures of what our new buildings will look like. Um, we're moving down to Temple Quarter uh, in May of this year. So it's very soon. We've had a lightning speed um, move from planning permission in October to moving in in May, which is pretty remarkable. The team's had an enormous amount of work to do to um, make that happen. But I'll talk through some of the images that you can see here in just a second. So. Um, I mentioned we started this, this process in sort of autumn in, in moving from what was CM1 into these buildings, which will be available a little bit sooner. And the phase one of this building, which is lovingly being called the sheds at the moment, glamorously called the sheds as well, um, will include some really significant facilities. So the first of which that's listed here is the neutral lab. This is an open space that will allow people from across every discipline and sector to come together for a concerted period of time to work together in a completely reconfigurable space. So as a team coming together as, as residents in the neutral lab, um, you could have someone from industry, from a community partner, from two or three um, faculties within the university and come together to co-create a space in the neutral lab that makes, makes sense for you. Um, you also have access to this amazing cupboard worth of kit. I mean, it's got everything from 3D printers to cardboard to glitter to VR headsets to you name it. Um, so it'll be a really exciting space, not only to support productive collaborations across disciplines within a team, but also with other people, other neutral lab residents. There's also the reality emulator, and I'll just skip back here. Um, so this is, um, I've heard it described as sort of a digital twin on steroids before, and I kind of like it. So I'm continuing to use that terminology. Um, but really what this enables is for real-time data to be um, 
pulled into a, a virtual production facility and digital um, twinning facility that is not only supported by an enormous data center, not only supported by um, incredible kind of computing facilities, but also that is then able to sort of, uh, allow you to experience that, that data and that digital twin in an immersive environment. So what you can see at the bottom right here is a, is a cave environment. So you could be standing in there with two or three other people um, and exploring that environment or that digital twin together. So I can imagine that there could be some really interesting um, use cases for this um, within your group. And we'd love to talk about that. Um, a little bit prior to that, we'll also be getting online in VR, AR room. Um, those are going through procurement at the minute, but I know the VR headsets that they're looking at are incredible. Um, so there's potential also to start making use of that prior to um, the full establishment of the reality emulator. And then in spring 2023, the phase two of the sheds opens. There's two buildings. I think you can see it um, up here. So this is the phase one, um, the first building, and then phase two is this larger one here. And that will include an instrumented auditorium. So it's an auditorium that allows you to showcase content to um, people in the auditorium and to explore their responses to that. So there'll be lots of um, kit being able to kind of monitor people's responses. Um, great for folks interested in um, understanding kind of audience reactions to digital media, but also great as a way of um, getting uh, running sort of participatory processes as well. Um, and I think I'm running a little bit over, so I'll shoot through. I, one thing that I should note is that whilst the sheds open um, in spring 2022, these facilities, particularly the reality emulator, you know, that's going to be a research project in its own right. It's enormously ambitious to have a sort of sector agnostic digital twin that can, can emulate a whole variety of, of different environments. So that will take some time to come fully online. The neutral lab will be available a bit quicker. And I'll skip through this. So opportunities for this group. I mean, I think I've tried to touch on these as I go through, but explicitly, you know, how could you be making use of the partnerships that have been established through BDFI? How can we be facilitating links with some of these organizations where it makes sense to you? How could you be making use of these facilities? Would you like to, to apply to be resident in the neutral lab? Would you like to be talking about potential use cases of the reality emulator and how that could work for your group? Um, we are running several events um, and networking opportunities over the coming year. We're likely to launch a, a sort of short seminar series with all of our academics, but also we have our symposium on the 4th of May, which we'd love to welcome you all to as well. Um, and then we also periodically have small pots of funding that we're able to um, award. We ran our first seed come funding opportunity last year. Um, currently, we have a knowledge exchange fellowship opportunity that is open and available on our website, I think, until the end of April for people to apply to. So we'd welcome any applications there. And also, if you are keen to sort of affiliate with or just be part of the Institute in some way, um, well, regardless of whether you're you want to do that we'd be really keen to help profile the brilliant work that is happening within your group where that makes sense for you so if we can be helpful in just shouting about your brilliant successes we'd love to do that and we've got a great um communications officer uh julia walton who'd be really keen to support any of your efforts there so i think i'm going to stop there with the bdfi overview um is it best to take questions on that now or shall we move straight to sonia's presentation um to explore a a super interesting area of work um, that she's working on. I'm I'm open to anything. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Haley. That was very interesting. I mean, um, shall we have a quick? Uh, so, I mean, are, do people have questions? Let's put it that way. Does anybody want to comment? Well, fine. Then we'll move on. <laughs> Okay. I've just stunned you into silence or bored you. Uh, well, I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I do have a few comments and questions, but you know, sure. honestly, why don't we just, yeah, move on and, and then we have a talk at the end. We got plenty of time. That'd be great. Okay, Sonia, over to you. Over to you, Sonia. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, first of all, thank you for having us. It's such a 
I, I, I am so excited uh, just to, to, to be a part of, of BDFI uh, in, in general. I think I'm just one of those, those, those happy people. I'm a, I'm a very uh, recent appointment and from mid January, which was my, my first day, I think it was the 17th of January. I still, I haven't stopped bouncing around and going like, I'm really I'm just so happy to be a part of this, this amazing initiative. And it's not just, um, an amazing initiative. It's a great group of people, great vision for that I have been working towards in, in the last 20 odd years in my career. But just to give you a brief, I don't have a presentation, um, um, but just I was just thinking about talking to you about my work and what I'm planning to do at BDFI and I mean, who I am to start with. So as you can sense from a bit of a twang in the accent, I think you probably guessed that I am, uh, well, I spent most of my life now in Australia. I'm an Australian academic, came from, from Melbourne uh, to London a few years back and then landed this opportunity, as I said, uh, mid-January. I'm a criminologist and a human rights lawyer by training. Um, law, it was my first degree, and then I went into a criminal law, and then a human rights law, and then criminal procedure law, and then criminology, <laughs> and then everything else following victimology, zimiology, um, uh, social sciences more broadly. But my area of research is more borders and mobility. Uh, that was the first big area of, of what I've what I've done in my career so far. So anything from human trafficking and and modern slavery, I don't like using that term, but it's it's now everywhere. So I suppose I should keep using it. Um, to to anything mobility, so preventing illegalized mobility, looking into um, policies around uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And then slowly I started just because, and I always say this story because it's so true, I, I was always a bit of a tech geek, but that's because everyone in my family is a software developer and, and an IT expert. So they have been challenging me as, as I went through my career, you know, my brother-in-law would come and say, well, hold on a second. Did you think about this? And I'm like, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I started introducing everything technology in my work about 15 years ago, uh, I would say, and firstly, in relation to borders and mobility. So my questions were, for example, you know, how, like, you know, facial recognition and, 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 you know, drones at the border, and then I'm sort of moved more and more boldly into anything tech. So started looking into other types of victimizations uh, via the use of technology, such as, for example, sexting, and then moved on to some other um, examples of crime. This is what I call crime technology nexus. And, and now I'm really excited about everything, crime prevention, offending, victimization, criminal justice, algorithmic justice, as we call it, you know, and um, I just wrote last year, this book, which is a, uh, a it, it's a provocation, really. It's 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 a book that that just aimed to start the conversation on all these topics about, for example, um, criminal liability, uh, criminal liability when it comes to machine learning, for example, um, and then and then everything else that you can imagine. So uh, at BDFI. And, and, and all, all this time while I was developing my career and, and my research profile, all I've wanted to is, is to start thinking about technology in a different sort of way. Because in criminology so far, there is a very predominant narrative that looks into technology as something that can help us address risks and prevent, you know, prevent um, or preempt even more problematically offending but it's all about risk you know identifying risk and jumping you know jumping to to address that risk um think for example predictive policing right so what we have right now in predictive policing for example is these these softwares these algorithms that tell you okay at this point in this part of london we are likely to see some you know some offending some some crime happen right so and i was thinking and of course, I said, yeah, you know, that's fine. This this is important, but we need to be thinking about technology a bit differently. And this is where, you know, I landed at BDFI, where we really want 
to think about how we can work with a range of partners, government, non-government, businesses, academia, everyone, to try actually to develop technology that can help us address some of the causes that underpin offending, as opposed to, you know, you know, thinking about, okay, if I, if I develop this part with this piece of software, if I have a drone that can do this, then I can potentially engage in crime prevention. Crime prevention is very important, but it's not the whole thing. Like we need to think about how we can use technology to actually do other things, you know, address, we know that, for example, in criminology it has not been, you know, it's, I'm not inventing uh, a hot, you know, uh, hot water here, but, you know, we know that poverty, we know that lack of education, we know that, you know, lack of opportunity, we know that inequalities, social inequalities, access to justice, these are the things that we need to be looking at. So hopefully I'll be working with a range of partners on, on, on some of these issues you know, some are a sort of more natural connection to me, obviously, for example, Ashley Community Housing, which is the partner that, that does su support refugees and asylum seekers in, in, in the UK. But then, for example, Airbus, who do a lot of stuff on border control, um, which for me is, 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 is a really important part, as I said, important part of my research. So, a lot to be excited about, a lot to look forward to. But again, for me, the most important thing is that we're looking at the crime and technology nexus differently now through the at BDFI. And also something that I've tried for many, many years that, that I've really constantly failed in doing, well, I wouldn't say cost in the pay, maybe I was relatively successful, was pairing up with people from other disciplines who are going to complement and challenge some of our thinkings in criminology because let's be honest we're not really doing that well given what we see out there so we need we need help from a variety of, of of people from other disciplines from as i said you know for me it was always in in my families you know in engineers and software developers and it people but a range of disciplines to start thinking about everything crime related in a different way and that's what i'm hoping to do at at bdfi and now i would stop there probably because i really want to have a conversation about what you think and and some of the questions that you might have about us and our team and um, i even please feel free to contact me mm -hmm. via email if you have some ideas or questions or anything at all that you would like to talk about so um yeah so i'll just stop there for now yeah, thank you, Sanya. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> fascinating stuff, especially since you mentioned algorithmic justice. And it just so happens I'll be lecturing on that on Monday. And my example will be Compass, which I presume you you know. Nice. That. Very yeah. nice, Stephen. Yes. And that's, that's um, the, the topic of that, that segment is the mathematical impossibility of fairness which is real. Right? Yes. A, a really intriguing uh, aspect of this. That... I am very familiar with your, with your work, Stephen. So, so okay. yeah, I've, I, was, I was waiting for this conversation to unfold now. Yeah, so and, I was and that's right. And of course, there's so much other algorithmic stuff. I mean, yeah. uh, and we've had a few talks in the group here on, on that. Um, and in fact, the project that Almog is working on, among others, is to reverse engineer uh, targeting algorithms, you know, I mean, Facebook news feeds and recommender systems. I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge, <laughs> I, I, you're absolutely right, incredibly exciting warehouse full of important questions that um, we, we can answer. So, uh, well, maybe not answer, but at least address, <laughs> do the search on. So thank you. Um, now over to everybody else with questions or comments. I think Michelle, you might be talking, but maybe you're muted. Oh. No, sorry, I have to mute because I've got three little dogs downstairs. They bark a lot in the background. Um, it's not so much a question, just a comment. I think your your journey from law to what you're doing now, Sandy, is absolutely fascinating. Um, so yeah, it's been, thank you for coming to talk to us because it's something I wouldn't have thought about as somebody who went straight into psychology. And I've got a lot of friends who did um, psychology and criminology at their undergraduate and masters. 
um yeah and it's just fascinating i should be looking for your book thank you so much yeah it's um but but again this is i think this is also what bdfi for me is 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 such a great such a great place because you know we you know <clears throat> We, we all sort of, we, we are conditioned to think in a certain way, I mm. think, through our disciplines, you know, and, and I'm, I'm very conscious of that. Um, but, you know, I've just had a conversation with, uh, with uh, another wonderful part of the team, Rashid, um, just recently, and, and, you know, he's from engineering, and he's doing similar stuff, but we talk in a different way about similar things. We still understand, we completely understand each other, but it's just, it's interesting how that, that that this disciplinary training is kicking in immediately but then you know bdf5 really can i think try to 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 and i think we need that i really think that if we have and i i, I'm, I would be interested to hear what Stephen thinks about this as well you know to address some of these things um that we see that are already super problematic we need to start thinking differently we need to start connecting differently we need to start you know I, and I think BDFI can be that place. Um, and that's why I was so excited when, I've, yeah. when I found well, this opportunity. Yes, Stephen. As, so as it happens, the ways Rashid yes. is one of our collaborators and Matthew, who just yeah. had to go, is, is in the same group. And so, well, in fact, Sophia, you're part of that group though, aren't you? Is that right? It, me? Yes. Yeah, me. I'm, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm... <laughs> and, so, and so, Sophia, you as well, yeah? I, I'm going to join them in September. So I was um, doing my dissertation under Steve um, last year, and then I'm going to join them in September. So yeah, amazing. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's lots more that I, I I'll I'll hold back now. I want others to uh, um, have a chance. Yeah. Um, Haley and maybe also uh, Sonia could um, shed some light of how exactly, like I'm thinking of my own research, which um, echoes a lot of the things that we've uh, discussed. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, what would be the best way to, um, to have it incorporated in, in BDFI? Like is, um, what does it mean to be an, uh, an associated fellow or something like that? Maybe you can, um, expand a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. I, should I take a stab at that, Sonia, and then you can add to it? I mean, I think in the first place, it, it would be great just to have I, all good things start with coffee, I think. Um, and I'd love to have a coffee because I think it starts with understanding kind of more about your research, more about how we can kind of add, um, add benefit to it, more about the ways that we can kind of connect you to partners and, and kind of uh, celebrate and um, support your expertise as part of that wider ecosystem. So I guess, yeah, I'm always advocate for having a, a coffee in the first instance to find out um, what that means. I think what I would say is that there's not kind of like a one size fits all. We don't do the same thing for every person that's engaged in the URI. I guess different people will need to engage at different times and in different ways with the Institute. The infrastructure though is kind of the same in that we exist to kind of bring people together from across those disciplines to support you to kind of connect into that broader ecosystem, maybe have different experiences and different conversations with people outside the immediate discipline, to have those interesting conversations also with partners, to support with funding where we can, to support with profiling your kind of work and expertise. But that it starts with that conversation to figure out how best we can kind of mobilize the, the Institute's kind of softer infrastructures, I guess, around, uh, around and in support of your interests. Is that clear enough? Is that okay? Or is that is that too much of a kind of a woolly answer? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I, I see Don popped up a question. Um, do you have an example of uh, some of the connections? Uh, Don, maybe you could... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I get that every uh, it's it's a bit different for every person, but maybe if we had some examples we, we of the sort of connections you're talking about, it might make it a bit clearer. Yeah, so I guess um, I'm just trying to think there's a, a confidential example that I could is a really good one that I could give. But so I had a conversation with an academic who um, made clear that they've got some particular expertise in looking at um, identifying uh, vessels or um, 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 trying to figure out the right word. Um, just different modes of transport, cars, trains, um, 
boats, but specifically boats, and had been using kind of visual analysis to do this stuff. So that's really interesting, great. Um, and then it just so happens that I spoke to a partner a couple of weeks ago who are trying to do a really similar thing with AI and learning about sort of visual analysis of, of pictures. And now we're going to put those two people together in a room to talk about actually what they might be able to do together. And that academic might be able to kind of get direct funding as a result of that interaction. So I guess um, just knowing a bit about people's experiences and expertise means that we can then be aware, you know, as we're kind of having conversations across every faculty and with all these partners, you can be aware, oh, brilliant, that could really help Dawn. Like, this is a great connection that could really help there. Um, so that's one way those kinds of things happen. They do also happen in a much more structured way. So I guess, I don't know, I'll, I'll use the example of Susan. She's just pulled together an enormous um, uh, funded center opportunity, but by working with people across different disciplines over time, I guess she's been able to realize, oh, there's a super interesting interdisciplinary team of people that we could collate together to, to generate a major research proposal. Let's put some time and effort behind actually making that happen. Um, so yeah, it happens in different different ways. Sonia, do you want to kind of add to that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think this is we're also because because of course being an university research institute, one of the th key things that we want to do is 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 connect you know you know to all the all the, the pockets of excellence and experience. It's going to take us some time. Like I'm I'm completely new to Bristol. I don't know who's doing what. I know in my area maybe a bit, you know, obviously, but you know, I'm I'm um as as Haley said, and people are going to hopefully come to us because, you know, we 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 have our core team is going to go everywhere and try to talk to all these different places and schools and 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 faculties and centers. And, and, you know, hopefully through, you know, some of this is going to be, I think, organic. It's going to develop through the conversations, you know, Dawn, your interest is in, in this and then you're going to come and talk to us and then we either find a partner or some of us go, oh, we know someone else who can. And, and I think our function as an institute, uh, or at least that's how I see it, is, is to, to really you know, generate that new energy um, and that is already there and just connect people a bit better in, in, in fostering not just relationships with partners, but also within the, within the University of Bristol and within different faculties and schools. So, so I think, you know, just, you know, shoot us an email and, you know, someone from BDFI, you have this idea, you're kind of thinking, oh, that align, that might align with the mission or I know that BDFI works with these partners that, you know, it might be interested in this and just come in and, and, and talk to us and it's an email. That's it. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Can I um, <clears throat> follow up on something Haley said earlier? And that's the Knowledge Exchange Fellowship, um, mm -hmm. which you said you're advertising now till the end of April. So what exactly is that? This is for somebody to visit BDFI for some amount. No? What is uh, it? So it's... Um... So it's a it's an opportunity for academics to take outward knowledge exchange secondments or for partners that you're interested in working with to take on inward secondments to the university um, that support uh, knowledge exchange between those organisations, so between the academic and an external party. So these are open to anyone across the university that considers themselves engaged in digital futures work. Um, it has to be led by a UAB academic and involve a partner, but the partner could be the inward party, if that if that makes okay. sense. Okay, so for example, I could partner up with whatever, you know, Greenpeace, Yeah. randomly picking that. And I could invite them to come here and teach us about whatever, whales or something. Uh, or I could go and visit them and, and cruise the Antarctic or, or something like that. Right. Exactly. There's, as you might expect with any funding opportunity, there are, well, this this comes, if it helps, just to kind of frame this. So it comes from a pot of funding in the university that's the um, ESRC Impact Acceleration. Oh, that, funding. right. Yeah. It's the same thing. Oh, wait a yeah. minute. So, so you're double badging that or, or is this separate money? It's been allocated to BDFI to do knowledge exchange and okay. impact related work. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because I've had one of those through yeah. the SRC IAA 
process. So it'll be a, it, the, the kind of the conditions and things are quite similar because we have to sort of right. abide by those kind of funder rules, but it's specifically for things that are related to digital features. Ah, okay. Really okay. Well, that explains it. And I know exactly what it's, yeah. uh, what it is about. And yeah, I can highly recommend it. Um, well, in my case, I went to Brussels for almost three months and worked with the European Commission. And it was just a very, very interesting experience. So, um, and the similar thing could be done here. I mean, it's, yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, right. Back to you guys. Questions? Any further questions? Can I ask a question? Sure, please do. So, um, I mean, there's two things. Um, one of them um, would be about sort of thinking about the, the facilities that we talked about. And it feels like maybe the reality emulator um, would be an interesting tool um, to kind of imagine alternative futures or to experiment with kind of different technologies within those um, within those futures, test reactions, see them, things like that. And I'm just wondering whether you can see sort of immediate um, use cases for something like that. I realize it's a big thing to kind of wrap your head around in a short period of time. Um, and the other question that I was going to ask is just whether or not just kind of bridging the link with Sonia's talk and whether or not you guys think about um, criminality of a lot of those kind of online activities, you know, like whether or not yeah. um, it's about justice or whether uh, there, there is actually kind of an element of criminality um, that's kind of considered as part of the part. Yeah, of I mean, the, it so, depends on what you mean by criminality, right? Yeah. I personally think that there is a lot of criminality on the internet uh, and, and people who are pumping out disinformation who I consider, who I would loosely consider to be criminals. Um, and so in that sense, yes, a lot, I mean, speaking for me personally, but obviously that's not a terribly official definition of, of criminality. Although um, at the European level, of course, they're now engaged in all sorts of policy actions to deal with um, well, misinformation and truth and advertising, that sort of thing. And, and I popped up this background, which is the result sort of of that knowledge exchange fellowship. It's a report I wrote for the European Commission um, with a team of authors that goes through all that legislative space. And also indeed, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm mentioning it, it has in it the foresight exercise about possible digital futures for Europe. Have you read it, Sanya? Uh, or have you heard of it? It's I've heard of it. Yes, I haven't had I haven't had a chance to read it, but yes, I love I love that. I, I, and I yeah, so it. this was actually one of those interesting experiences where you, I mean, for me it was very interesting because I um, I went to Brussels and spent the day in a, in a room full of I don't know thirty or forty people from different you know policymakers, uh, uh, stakeholders. You know, Google was there and Facebook. And we kind of designed four different possible futures of the European information space. And it's a very interesting exercise. It kind of um, blew my head because it, it, it was just mind boggling to really explore what these different scenarios, what it might actually look like. And this is not how to get there. The exercise was to explore what it would be like. Yeah. Uh, and never mind how it would happen. No, but what would it be like? And some of the stuff is seriously scary when you start thinking about it. So uh, in that sense, <laughs> you know, there, there is a link between what we do to criminality and, of course, our focus on technology and democracy mm -hmm. kind of entails a commitment to the rule of law, you know, kind of like governments obeying treaties that they signed up to. That's kind of like sort of we have a bias towards that. Uh, I think, if only tacitly, um, yeah, but not really crime, <laughs> you know, not, I haven't, I don't think any of us have done any work on sort of shoplifting or other stuff. Um, Simon, by the way, is doing some work on deep fakes, so okay. um, that's... Yeah, I mean, I was, I was just about to pop up and say that because 
I mean, deep fakes themselves obviously have a potential criminal element to them, but also the, the, the paradigm that I'm designing to research them is based on um, confessions. So mm. there's a very much a criminal element to that as well. So, wow. um, you know, false, false confessions, which could be manufactured using deep fakes and then used um, <clears throat> either on social media or possibly in court. This is very much both of these, um, Stephen and Simon, both of, both of these um, um, uh, contexts are very, very much part of what I would broadly call digital criminology, whatever you want to call it. And it's certainly within remit of BDFI. <laughs> this is the, this is the, both of these things, particularly, I mean, deep fakes, if you think about it, um, obviously, like, it's not just about how problematic they are in terms of, in terms of the, you know, um, the, the misconstructing their reality but there are in, in, in many in many cases um, and, and they have not been studied very carefully within criminology. This is why we need to reach out to other disciplines, right? Because we, 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 we know that there are experts you know around the place looking at these things but you know are not necessarily looking into the criminal aspect or whatever criminological aspect of 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 the problem which is what we can offer but then we have engineers and and and, and experts who can look into the you know the technical side we, then we have psychologists who are going to look at how can we perhaps address the issue of you know my mum believing these things when she sees them, those kind of things. That's why I, I think that's why BDFI is, 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 is such a critical place because when we go to neutral lab and we have our own tools and then we can say, well, how, how are people going to react when they see Boris Johnson deep fake, you know, scaring the living bejesus out of them and they go and, and buy, you know, 50 liters of, 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 of petrol um, each and then all of a sudden we have a crisis in the UK you know these kind of things and we can then we can then even see that and live it through in in their reality emulator or in the first phase in the VR so sort of thing. Do, do you have do you have a deep fake manufacturer as part of BDFI? Uh, I'm, I'm semi-serious because uh, Simon needs his stimuli and um, the first dude who we had to produce the uh, his deep fake for uh, just for testing purposes uh, is in Russia, and that's not a good place to be right now because we can no longer pay them. Um, so we. we <laughs> do you have any okay. BDF? Talk us, through, talk us through that again, Stephen. So you're looking for people to create deep fakes? Is that yeah. the yeah, yeah for research purposes? Yes. Well, I mean, so we say yes, but you can trust us. It's mainly for research. Yes. Um, well, this is, some, this is certainly sorry to interrupt, but this is certainly something I don't think I don't think anyone is at the moment. And we have quite a few, don't we, Haley? You you know this so much better than I do. I'm still fairly new and trying to understand what each mean, partner does. Yeah. These people are out there, they exist. And in fact, Simon has somebody right at their fingertips pretty much uh, now. Again, uh, it's just our Russian connection got uh, disrupted by world events. Um, and if you happen to have a guy or a person local who is into that sort of thing, then of course that would be an obvious connection to explore because yeah, um, yeah I mean, you know, we need, we need deep fakes for this project specifically, but also, as Sanya said, I think generally it is probably one of these, um, you know, interesting digital challenges for the for the future. Yeah, and I'm kind of wondering. I mean, the kind of the reality emulator technology as it as it stands is is creating kind of you know digital. It's beyond a digital twin facility, but you could you know consider this as kind of replicating. Um, a, a reality and I guess there's a question of kind of like how might they be misused in the future and one of the things that Rashid is one of our academics is really interested in is is also the kind of security of those digital twin facilities as well um, so I guess there's, there's maybe even a, an interesting crossover there between kind of what's currently happening in deep fakes and how that kind of activity might translate in the future into yeah we've, um, we've spoken to refrain as well uh, yeah. to, to look into that. Um, another thing, sorry, Haley, you did mention something about how we would make use of that virtual, the VR facility, right? Mm -hmm. 
but that doesn't exist yet. No, so I think the, the VR headsets are being procured right now. Um, I don't, it's not going to be on the button in May that those are available. I can find out when that room yeah. and that set of suite of facilities is likely to be available, but I don't think it'll be very long. And because the idea is that the that's usual, a... This is the goggles and gloves and things that... Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, isn't Ian Gilchrist involved in that? So I think Ian's been brought in um, to consult at different stages, mm -hmm. certainly on the reality emulator and thinking about how we kind of look at how people are, are interacting in that space and what they need to see and where the cameras need to be and all those kinds of things um, in the in the cave environment. Um, I'm not sure whether he's been involved in the virtual reality um, side of things. I think um, the, the IT team are also going to reach out to Andrew Calway um, to get his views that he does um, AR and VR work in the university as well to help with that kind of inform the procurement from a research perspective too. Um, but if there's anyone else you think we should be talking to, um, it would be great to, to know more about that. Almog, did I see, sorry, did you try and come um, in then as well? I'm, I'm just thinking that this would be just a cool setting to, to think of an experiment. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking of all the sorts of things that you can do from my perspective. Um, I don't know, like flagging the political affiliations of people and see how the interactions go and, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, but that like is, is far ahead. It's something that we could discuss and see if it's uh, even uh, if it's feasible. Um, but it looks um, it, it it sounds really promising and, and, and interesting uh, tool to uh, to explore. Um, I I did want to comment going back to uh, to the criminality. Uh, point. Um, it's not super di <laughs> and super related, I, but kind of. I I have some work on um, information operations online on uh, how, um, for example, Russian trolls were involved in in driving polarization and stuff like that. And I was wondering if this fits under criminality. Um, but, um, yeah, this. <laughs> And again, this is this is why another thing I know that we're you know referred to refrain a lot here, and it's all about you know cyber security and 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 understanding you know privacy and cyber cyber criminality. But really, what BDFI? I think what re, my remit within the BDFI is so much more broader. It's 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 thinking really about not just about how technology help us or help offenders offend or enable offending, but also how technology, you know, how technology creates environment in which offending can happen. This is exactly what you're talking about, right? So you're talking about, you know, um, you're talking about um, creating an environment where, you know, offending is, is promoted, enabled, enhanced. Um, Which is being abused is, by external agents. Correct, you know, and 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 in all of this stuff, you know, is is really what. And when I wrote that book, that was one of the key things that I wanted to do. I wanted to, for us as within my discipline to start thinking about criminology, digital criminology beyond cyber, right? So, so to think about, you know, to think about artificial intelligence, to think about the internet of things, to think about autonomous mobile robots, to think about blockchain, to think about um, cloud computing, quantum computing, all these things, but also to think about the stuff that we already have as a problem. So again, when Stephen was talking about that foresight approach, you know, thinking about the, you know, how the, the, the past and the immediate now looks like, but also, you know, imagining the future. But also, I think for us at BDFI, it's going to be important to do backcasting as well. So think about desired future and then work to create that desired future. And that's where we, you know, um, for example, when it comes to these, 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 these activities of trolls, as you said, this is something that is really quite critical. Because um, if we don't address that now, we're going to have a problem in the future. But can we imagine how we can not have that problem in uh, like, you know, five, 10 years time? Mm -hmm. that, that is something that I'd be really, really interested to hear from you, for example. You know, not, it's not just about addressing the problem that we have now, but also thinking, you know, beyond that. Yeah, I think I think actually the sort of imagining future stuff is very interesting. 
I just had a paper with, uh, I did a, uh, published a paper a few months ago with uh, Carrie Facer from Education. I don't know if you know, Haley, you know her, who's a qualitative researcher. And it was a study about the future people wanted after COVID. That's what it was about. And so she did the qualitative component. You know, we had a sort of open response, tell us what you think sort of thing. And it, it, in addition to quantitative, you know, sort of survey items. And it was quite interesting to see what, uh, what people came up with. And, and I, I, to me, the most interesting thing was that the, <laughs> it, it seemed to be the case that everybody who wanted something for the future wanted other people to do something different. So uh, 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 they didn't actually talk about themselves as much as they talked about, oh, people should stop whatever, polluting, or people should stop uh, smoking, or whatever, you know. And, and so there was this very, uh, um, just from looking at what people said, a very distinct lack of agency of themselves that people expressed, but they expected everybody else to fix the problem. I'm being a little bit cartoonish in, in, in presenting this, but in a nutshell, that's what we found. And we also, that was supported also by the quantitative data, which showed that everybody wants to build back better from COVID and have a progressive future, but everybody also thinks, A, they won't get it, and B, that everybody else wants something different. So, uh, which is not the case, but there's this mismatch between what people think others want, what they actually want, and this sort of weird, denial of agency and putting it onto other people. And um, so I'm just putting that out there in case you're, you're interested, I can yeah. send you the link uh, to the paper. Um, and that's kind of, but, but that is something, you know, maybe as a, a starting point, and it's not the only, we're not the only people to have observed that. There are other similar. Uh, observations out there. So this whole idea of um, reclaiming agency, I think, is is a really important one, irrespective of what you want for the future. Somebody's going to have to work for it. And at the moment, <laughs> it's always somebody else, not not the none of our participants themselves. I'm exaggerating, but but there is that sort of tendency. Yeah, Haley. Well, I was just going to, I'm sure there's a quote somewhere um, from one of our recent symposiums, uh, which uh, I think Susan had said, the future is active in the choices that we make in the present. You know, it's sort of trying to bring it down to the fact that this, this future isn't out there and it isn't just going to kind of happen to us. We are all in all of the decisions that we're making all the time, in all the ways that we innovate, in all the ways that we research are creating futures. It's an active process. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a doing process. And if we kind of try and sort of retain that as kind of a principle that we think about the futures that we're actively creating in the present and think about what futures we're opening up when we act in the way that we do and what futures we're closing down and for who, um, that's a really good sort of starting point. So I like the way that you kind of turn that to, to kind of be agent, agency, like talk about talking about agency. And I think that's, you know, I think infusing together different disciplines to think about how we do that together as well it becomes a really exciting space yeah. where we yeah. challenge ourselves to think about those features that we're proactively opening up and actively opening up yeah and also how to you know how do you then deal with that because to me that's a real problem if people number one aren't calibrated to what other thing what others think which we observed and secondly they don't think they have any power to change anything and you know that sort of helplessness uh, uh, or disengagement or the notion that you know other people are determining my future. I think that's uh, problematic, but I also don't find it entirely surprising, given the state of society and and whatever we want for the future. I would suggest that's probably the first or a first point of you know, point of attack where you, where you try and say, well, hang on guys, actually <laughs> there's stuff you can do, uh, so. Yeah, but also work with those kind of powerful actors who might, you know, uh, have considered themselves to have quite a lot of agency in the process of kind of creating features with, with new technologies and, and think about how to disrupt that. And we talk quite a lot about disruption. It's kind of falling into the, 
kind of common narrative of the institute and, and kind of how we work to say what can we disrupt why are we disrupting it um <laughs> what do we want to kind of achieve as a result of that well um, that's that's asking that question is a good one i mean the disrupt i mean dom cummings wants to disrupt things you know yeah. all the people who read a book at the airport you know these airport things that you can buy about disruptive change you know they sort of did their thing and now they've disrupted everything but it hasn't actually achieved anything that well not as far as i can tell uh so yeah i'm i have mixed feelings about uh disrupting things it's, it's... yeah well i guess if we look at sort of disrupting traditional processes of innovation um because some of them as you say claim to be disruptive and, and claim to kind of create features like particular features and um they may not be what what's wanted or needed by yeah everybody say so. but also i think and and on that note i think and, and this is where i hope that my contribution is going to be just to help you know sometimes in the process of creating these these technologies um some of the the, the consequences and impacts and harms are not necessarily immediately obvious mm. you know and so yeah. i think for me disruptive is is kind of you know making people pause and think um before they go in a certain path and before they develop something that ultimately you know even with, with, with the greatest of good intentions can actually be quite harmful or maybe even more harm you know sometimes in in trying to do the good thing you end up just not creating and not delivering for for everyone or not to an extent that you thought so this is this is our role as well to 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 have those conversations, you know, if we develop this surveillance technology for asylum seekers and refugees, is this really going to help them or is it going to make them, you know, go and try a different, you know, different route where they're probably going to end up being dead in a desert or in the Mediterranean? Is this what we want? Uh, or, you know? Yeah. Or the channel. Yeah. Uh, That's right. So yeah, but thank you. I think it's two o'clock, our, our time. Yeah, uh, yeah, we need to wrap up. So, um, Haley and Zion, thank you so much for joining us. It was really interesting to hear about uh, BDFI. And I think uh, a lot of us, well, some of us, <laughs> hopefully a lot will be in, uh, in contact with you. Um, Definitely. On. Thank yeah. you. That that would be wonderful. Please do. Um, please do. And and yeah, just send us, you know, any ideas, any comments, anything at all. We're really, really interested to hear from all of you. Thank you again for having okay, me. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you guys. And I think some of us might be staying behind for our professional development thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, bye, Sam. Bye-bye. Uh, uh, bye. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Thank you uh, so much, Joe. Been a pleasure. Yeah, so... Um...